हेलो वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम ज्योति प्रसाद चैटार्जी एसोसिएट प्रफेसर इन सोशियोलजी बैरकपुर राष्ट्रगुरु सुरेंद्रनाथ कलेज वेस्ट बेंगल इंडिया टूडे आई उल बी टकिंग ऑन फार्मार्स मुभमेंट इन इंडिया दिस इज ए मड्यूल अंडार द पेपर सोशल मुभमेंट्स इन इंडिया आई उल बी टकिंग ऑन दिस इश्यू बिकज फार्मार्स मुभमेंट हेज़ बीन भेरि इंटरेस्टिंग एंड इम्पर्टेंट इमार्जिंग ट्रेंड इन इंडियन सोसाइटी अफेन उइ कन्फ्यूज इट उ दि लंग ट्रेडिशन अफ पीजन मुभमेंट्स इन इंडिया बट देर आर सार्टन डिफरेंसेस आई मिन फंडामेंटल डिफरेंसेस विटुईन दिस टू टाइप्स अफ मुभमेंट द पीजन मुभमेंट्स एंड फार्मार मुभमेंट्स आर फंडामेंटाली डिफरेंट एंड थ्रू दिस मड्यूल आई उल बी ट्राइंग टू लोकेट दोज डिफरेंसेस हाउ फार दोज डिफरेंसेस आर जस्टिफाएबल और whether that differences um, can be taken for a close sociological scrutiny so scholars there have been scholars researchers and social analysts uh, who are divided as i have already mentioned that what is the conflict core of the of the farmers movement that makes it different from the peasant movement that i'll be trying to look at then scholars try to see in it a continuation there are a group of scholars or a cross section of researchers who try to see in the farmers movement a continuation of the trend of the peasant movements i mean earlier peasant movements whether others consider or others find a disjuncture that the peasant movements and the farmers movement there is a kind of fundamental disjuncture which i was trying to mention and what this module try to explore that where is that disjuncture how far that disjuncture can be located sociologically is there any fundamental difference so uh, that disjuncture or study of that disjuncture is very important we should uh, be able to locate the differences between this apparently similar type of movements peasant movements and farmers movements but we must be i mean conscious about their differences here focus uh naturally will be on these orientations i mean those consider it as a continuation of the peasant movement i mean the farmers movement as a continuation of the earlier peasant movements or those who try to or 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 who finds out fundamental differences or disjunctures between these two forms of movements so what is the basic question is what is the nature of the uh conflict core of the farmers movement or basically what characterizes the farmers movement it emerged in the 1970s and um uh, has been continuing since then and got further momentum in 1980s farmers movement in india has exposed i mean has revealed bring into force certain new or emerging contradictions of uh indian agrarian society so what are those emerging or newer contradictions of the in uh, of the indian agrarian society that we should be uh, focusing upon the earlier mobilizations of the small and marginal peasants that is the term that is the small and marginal peasants they were the major players of the earlier peasant movements and their confrontation was with the with the, with the zamindars and this marginal uh, small peasants often in congruence with the landless agricultural laborers they fought against the zamindars and landlords so this was the character or nature of the traditional peasant movement or the earlier peasant movement of the 1940s 50s 60s but from 1970s onwards newer contradictions in the shape of newer uh, i mean conflicts came up in indian agrarian society and farmers movement they uh, reflected this sort of contradictions or conflicts of the indian agrarian society the farmers movement uh, basically uh, is the outburst often outburst of the of the of the middle peasant of and and certain portion of the rich peasant against the state their adversary or the enemy is not the zamindars or the landlords of the earlier peasant movements so that 
that's why some cross section of the scholars researchers and sociologists believe that farmers movement has a basic disjuncture farmers movement has a very fundamental difference with the earlier tradition of peasant movements in india now we should be very clear about the two terms that is farmers and peasants what are the distinctions what are the fundamental differences between these two terms often uh, i mean there is a kind of i mean trend of thinking that the farmers and the peasants these two are all the same there is no difference between this term but uh, we must be very careful we must be very cautious about their analytical separatedness look what is or what characterizes a peasant a peasant is a poor smallholder or farm laborer of low social status so if he is a poor he or she is a poor farm laborer of low social status and the term peasant is used with reference to subsistence agriculture not a very kind modern type of agriculture it's a subsistence form of agriculture characterized or taking place mostly in the poorer countries but what about the farmer farmer is a person who owns or manages a farm he owns he or she owns or manages a farm so he or she is the owner unlike the peasant who is a farm laborer or a very small holder the farmer manages a farm and uh, while the peasant occupies the lower strata of the rural society the farmer often occupies the upper strata of the rural society so they are i mean quite distinct categories although although both of these categories are located in the agrarian sector but they occupy very distinct social stratum so that differentiates the two terms and possibly on the on the basis of this difference the two movements also differ because the demands of the peasants and the demands of the farmers they do not converge often they diverge so the movements also takes different shapes so farmers movements and peasant movements they often acquires different paths different demands different characteristics different natures that's why we are focusing on farmers movement exclusively here now uh, i will try to look at or map the farmers movement or their organizations and leadership look what are the basic organizations or what are the important organizations of the farmers movement the first maybe very important one is the shatkari sangathan led by sharad joshi in maharashtra the shatkari sangathan led by sharad joshi in maharashtra in maharashtra farmers movement was very vibrant and the next one this is also very important probably more important uh, than any other states that is the bharatiya kishan union bku it was led by ms tikayat in uttar pradesh and next ajmer singh lakhowal balbir singh rajwal and bhupinder singh man in punjab they led the farmers movement in punjab bharatiya kishan sangh in gujarat and tamiliga baiwa sabhavigal sangham or tvs in tamil nadu led by narayana sami naidu and karnataka rajya rayata sangh or krrs in karnataka led by md nanjundwa swami so these are the basic i mean more most important organizations of the farmers movement and the leaders so uh, the the location of the movement is very clear that it is pan indian i mean both in the north and in the south the span was very extensive so farmers movement a kind of all india pan india affair now uh, i will be focusing on some important demands and going through the demands we can be in a position to distinct the farmers movement with the earlier tradition of peasant movements so what are the important demands Uh, of the farmers movement first one that is lower prices on farm inputs like seeds fertilizers pesticides that is a typical farmers demand that uh, we are using this uh, farming inputs and naturally we will be demanding lower prices for our inputs then lower tariffs on electricity and water because these are also 
uh, I mean necessary conditions for a successful farming that the prices or tariffs on electricity and water should be low. Then abolition of land revenue. If there is any provision of land revenue that has to be abolished and imposition of tax based only on output alone. So tax may be imposed but that should be based on output alone. And then waiving of loans owed by the farmers exclusively to the government because the government uh, is supposed to, I mean, protect the farmers' interest. So it should come up with policies for waiving loans of the farmers uh, from the loans of the banks and cooperative societies. So all the loans should be waived. Then fixation of agricultural prices realistically. Realistically, what does it mean? That it has to be calculated keeping into consideration the input cost. So agricultural prices should be fixed by keeping into consideration the input cost that how much a farmer is investing and how much he is getting out of that. So considering these two the price of agricultural product has to be fixed. Then uh, we are coming some of, to some of the important features of farmers movement. So, if we consider on the demands, we have got that that farmers movement is a typically kind of middle or rich farmers case because nowhere the landless laborers case has been I mean taken up by the farmers organization. So it's a typical demand of the middle, mostly middle and upper uh, rung of the rural peasants or rural farmers. Then from this we will be uh, just moving to the features because these two will be linked. So the first important feature and these features have been mentioned by Professor Dhanagare and this the most important or the first I mean uh, feature as mentioned by Professor Dhanagare that farmers movement is pan Indian in scope. Pan Indian means just I have mentioned that from north to south save a certain portion of the east, I mean say Kerala, West Bengal and some northeastern states, save these states or apart from these states, farmers movements uh, have their presence in almost all the states of India, starting from Punjab to Gujarat to Rajasthan to Tamil Nadu to Karnataka, everywhere farmers movement started uh, or gained momentum during 1970s, 1980s, continued to 1990s. So they have a pan-Indian scope and then not only pan-Indian in scope, they have a very uniform uh, form of demands. There is a kind of similarity in the demands raised by the farmers movement in different states. Say uh, the cost based agricultural price, lowering of say input prices or fixing of uh, farm products or fixing of the price of farm products depending upon the cost of the inputs. So these there were certain demands which were uniformly spread throughout the states. Although the Movements of Rajasthan, movement of Gujarat, movements of farmers in Punjab or movements of uh, farmers in Tamil Nadu, they have got certain internal differences. Say the movement of Punjab might have certain differences with the movements in Karnataka. But the thing is that this sort of uniformity in the demand was there. So that is the second major, uh, in, I mean, feature of the, of, the, of the farmers movement in India. And third, third important feature is common strategies of agitation. So wherever the movement is taking place, it may be in Punjab, it may be in Haryana, it may be in Maharashtra, it may be in Karnataka or Tamil Nadu, but certain common strategies of agitation uh, have been there. First one is massive demonstrations. This is, a, this is a typical movement strategy of many sort of movement, not only farmers movement, but farmers movement in different states of India also take, uh, has taken recourse to this, that massive demonstrations. Rail and Rasta Roko, this is a kind of agitational form, again most of the movements, not only farmers movement, but many different types of movements, uh, student movements or say ethnic movements, they often take recourse to this uh, strategy, Rail and Rasta Roko. Then Gabbad, that is uh, restricting the entry of the government officials into the villages, that is barring the entry, that you are not allowed to enter the villages because you are not doing what you are supposed to do for us. That is the, I mean, demand of the farmers. So, government and boycott of Mandis, Mandis, that the farmers are refusing to sell the farm products to the local markets. That is the boycott of Mandis, that we will not sell our farm products to the 
to the nearby markets, local markets, so that there will be trouble. Then intellectual and charismatic leadership. First, the leaders of the farmers' movements were essentially farmers. This is one. But not only farmers, their more, more important identity was that they were educated, often they were intellectual, and often they have a sort of charismatic qualities. So that all in all the states, farmers' movements, they have a well-educated intellectual leadership. Not only they were able to agitate the masses, but they could explain the situation before the masses, they could explain the causes of the, I mean, suffering of the farmers. So, in that way, farmers, farmers movement often gets differentiated from other movements in that, that farmers movement's leadership, they often bear a kind of or possess a sort of charisma. So, they attract the people by virtue of that. Now, this is uh, a common place with the farmers movement that often scholars argue, I mean both in India and abroad, that farmers movement they have or bear important similarities with the new social movement. Now this is an important arena of discussion that what are new social movements, what are the basic I mean features of new social movements, how does it get differentiated from the traditional movements or the quote unquote old movements. So, uh, let us first concentrate on the new social movement theory and then we will be trying to locate the similarities and of course the dissimilarities of the farmers movement with the new social movement. Uh, look careful consideration of the issues as we have already done, concerns, values. Uh, modes of orientation or modes of participation or strategies of agitation of the movement have often led many scholars to identify it with the new social movements. So, uh, our question is how far this farmers movement can be equated with the new social movement or whether it can be equated or not. Then, so we are now moving straight on to the very basic arguments of new social movement theory. So, in a new social movement, participants, I mean those who participate in the new social movements, they do not seek to return to an undifferentiated community like say class or anything, undifferentiated community free of all power and all forms of inequality. So, this is the very, I mean, uh, important uh, feature of uh, social movement and, and that makes it new because often social movements do not have this sort of demands or the participants do not have this, this sort of objectives. Second, the participants struggle in the name of autonomy. The issue is autonomy, plurality and difference. So, they show their respect to difference, they show their respect to plurality while they seek autonomy. And next one, they they, they stress upon the value of relativism. They relativize their own values and with respect to one another. So, difference is normal. There should be difference. There should be differences of opinion. There should be differences of thinking, thought, etc. And they respect it because they emphasize the relativity or they relativize their own values vis-a-vis -vis others. They put more emphasis on the issues of culture. This is, this is the crucial, I mean, determinant of new social movement that the basic emphasis is on the point of culture and identity not or more than class often it transcends the boundary of class and they enters the realm of culture they they enter the realm of uh, say identity so culture identity is more important than class in new social movement and of course in doing so they also accept the existence of democratic state and the market economy. So, they are not against market economy, they are not against the state. So, so this is a sort of movement where the conflict is basically uh, over certain post-materialist values. Post-materialist means that it is not materialist values like say economic demands or something else, it is post-materialist values and so conflict over material resources is not that important in new social movement or not at all important in new social movement. The basic 
concrete core is composed by the post materialist values so basically the conflict is not located in the sphere of material reproduction rather it is located in the sphere of cultural reproduction so the conflict takes place in the sphere of culture in the sphere of cultural reproduction social integration socialization not in the sphere of material reproduction and they are i mean the new social movements are manifested in sub institutional level extra parliamentary forms of protest and basically they are non party mobilization so no political party is leading the movement it is not a movement for say kind of political mileage or political gain or loss is a movement which basically is non partisan this is a movement which or or, or new social movements are basically non party mobilization then often we say that 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 certain categories are structurally determined so like class or caste they are structurally determined new social movement theories believe that identities are not structurally determined they are not givens so what is the what is identity or how does it constructed identity is constructed during the course of the movement so it is basically the movement which constructs identity not that identities are participating in the movement during the course of the movement the identities of the participants are shaped reshaped redesigned refashioned so the thing is that that new social movement is always in the process of unfolding it is always in the process of making now how far we can consider farmers movement as a new social movement or whether at all we can consider it so first let us concentrate on the on the on the similarities of the farmers movement with the with the new social movement thesis we have just mentioned so what are the important similarities first one is that that the agency of the farmers movement is not with the peasants the agency is with the farmers that we have Uh, already mentioned in the very beginning of our uh, discussion that the farmers movement is led by the farmers not by the peasants and we have already discussed the differences between the uh, term farmer and peasant so we know that the farmers movement or is led by the farmers so the agency is not with the peasants the farmers movement agency is definitely with the farmers or the middle or the upper section of the of the rural society then the focus of agitation has shifted from land to price that is the important distinction between peasant movement and farmers movement that always peasant movements they are demand or their focus was on the issue of land but the farmers movements demand has shifted from the issue of land to price like remunerative price or 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 justified uh, price for the farm products so the issue or the conflict core is composed in the issue of price not in the in, in land then it's also a non party form of agitation in most of the states the organizations i have just mentioned like shatkari sangathan or bku in maharashtra or punjab respectively most of the cases these organizations they were non party kind of uh, form or the agitation was also non party form then certain distinctive and novel forms of agitation uh, farmers movement have always employed so what are those i have uh, just mentioned uh, about gabband rail and rasta roko dharna means demonstration and i mean refusing to sell products into local markets the so that is boycott of mandis so these are the novel methods of agitation which differentiates the farmers movement often with other forms of class movements specifically peasant movements now farmers movement often includes multiple traditions within its fold so often farmers movement they cater to the interest of the women's movement often they cater to the interest of the environmentalist movement so we often find existence of multiple traditions within the fold of the farmers movement now the existence of multiple i mean traditions uh, brings the uh, farmers movement very close to the orbit of new social movement now uh, some more similarities of farmers movement with the new social movements look the the important one is that that the enemy of the movement or the or the conflict of the movement or the uh, or or the adversary of the movement is not uh, any ex- internal agency it is often external agency like state 
or say industrial capital, international capital, urban area. So the the basic struggle or the or the conflict is not within the rural society. The conflict is out with outside the rural society with certain external agencies like state or urban areas or industrial areas or industrial urban capital, international capital. So the struggle against external agencies or basically the state that the state versus the farmers so it is not that the that the landless laborers they are fighting against the zamindars both in the i mean within the scope of the rural areas the farmers are struggling against the state the farmers are struggling against the urban areas so that is the way that the enemy or the struggle is against certain external agencies then entire rural population irrespective of caste, creed, religion, economic categories, political differences are mobilized. So we or anybody or no one can characterize farmers movement with, the, with a singular dimension. Farmers movement is always multidimensional. We often find the, the, the I mean solidarity across the levels, the solidarity across the layers of farmers. So irrespective of caste, creed, religion, ethnicity, uh, or class farmers movement is a kind of total rural mobilization against certain external agencies so large number of issues are addressed large number of issues we have mentioned only some important demands that we have mentioned here but there are some more issues with which farmers movement have dealt now it wants to retrieve community and life we the rural people, we should have autonomy, we should have this, we should have that. So this sort of communitarian life which they perceive has been engendered or has been jeopardized by the advent of external agencies, maybe the state, maybe the global capital or the international capital, anything. So this is quite crucial or very important dimension of farmers movement which brings it very close to uh, new social movement. Now, organizational pattern is also uh, that brings it close to new social movement that it is anarchic in that sense it is postmodern that no fixed sort of movement uh, organizational pattern is there no fixed sort of organizational uh, character is there so what is that that organizational form is anarchic in the sense that it is postmodern it stresses on difference it stresses on uh, freedom or autonomy so it builds structures around actions rather than routine organization. The structures are built around action. It's no routine organizational work is there. So certain actions have, uh, I mean, have to be performed. So we are assembled here and performing this. After we have finished the action, you may not have a trace of the organization. So that is the kind of flexibility or that is one may call it anarchic. And then it is very ad hoc and flexible membership instead of fixed membership. Farmers movements organizations, their membership is very ad hoc and flexible. No fixed membership, no strict uh, rules of organization that uh, somebody should be secretary has to be uh, or there has to be a president, there has to be a uh, local committee or there has to be a sort of state committee. This is not the case with farmers movement. So no fixed rules of organization. For the action we have to perform, there is a kind of organization. Once the action is performed, the organization gets just diffused and no strict tires between local intermediate and top levels in organization so organizational hierarchy is also not there as it is ad hoc as it is flexible so there is no organizational i mean strict organizational hierarchy often there are certain persons with certain responsibilities but that doesn't mean that there are organizational hierarchies in fact they often talk against organizational hierarchies because this is a movement for the total rural emancipation so the the concept of hierarchy often is not there and so what is the cardinal principle anybody who participates in the agitation is a member so if you participate in any of the agitational program you become a member so there is no question of say very strict or very i mean fixed sort of membership or fixed pattern of organization just if you participate in the agitation, you are a member. So that is a sort of flexible membership that farmers movement have and it brings it very close to new social movement concept. Now, 
Farmers movement represent, therefore, we have considered that farmers movement represents the new politics. That is not the politics we know. That is not the sort of institutional politics with which we are accustomed. So, farmers movement represents a new politics and they occupy the non-institutional space, non-party platform. There is no partisan interest, no, I mean, political part or no farmers organization is striving to, say, attain any electoral mileage or political power. They are for the farmers unity. They want the autonomy of the farmers. They want the I mean, self-respect for the farmers, identity of the farmers has to be protected. So, that is a sort of non, I mean, political or non-institutional space which the farmers movement uh, occupies. So, this brings it again very close to new social movement according to Habermas and off. They all have talked that new social movements basically operate in the non-institutional space of politics and this is new in this sense and farmers movement also performs or farmers movement also occupy this non-institutional non-political space and this brings it very close to, to uh, new social movement and exactly its orientation is non-class or post-class. So farmers movement as I have already mentioned that it transcends uh, or it, it crosses the boundaries, all limits of class, caste, religion. So, it is non-class and so it is post-class also. This is again a difference, important difference with the peasant movement. That peasant movement is basically was with the question of class. The conflict was with the issue of class. But here the conflict is not with the issue of class. So, it is the basic orientation is not with class. It is with, uh, I mean, something else than class. It is beyond class or it is post class and so the larger issue is farmer identity that farmer identity has to be I mean protected that I have mentioned that farmer identity is something that has been created during the course of the movement and that has to be carried forward it has to be protected and it has to be respected so farmers movement they, they often operate in this non-institutional, non-political platform, non-political, non-institutional space of politics. Now, as we are talking about identity so much, so uh, ontologically, I mean, what are the basic constitu constituents of this identity? What constitutes the farmer's identity? Or we will be asking or we will be examining the ontology of the farmer's identity. So, here as our discussion uh, is continuing, we can see that the uh, basic ingredients of farmer's identity or the basic, uh, I mean, essence of farmer's identity lies within the structural binaries of two distinct categories. First one is rural versus urban. So, it is a conflict of the rural versus the urban and the identity of the farmers is located within that boundary, that rural versus urban. It is also located within the boundary of agricultural versus industry or that means that, that, the, the, that the agricultural sector is in conflict with the industrial sector or something similar like colonized versus colonialist. The farmer's identity ontologically is located within this boundary of colonized versus the colonialist. And again, it is indigenous versus non-indigenous. And broadly, if we have a very broad notion of this, that is the identity of the farmer ontologically is located within the binary of the east versus the west. So, if we consider the famous slogan extended by Sharad Joshi, Bharat against India, that perfectly epitomizes or exhibits this sort of binary operation. That how Joshi uh, uh, conceptualizes Bharat against India, that is a basically conflicting configuration. Bharat against India means that he is locating Bharat uh, against India, that means India, according to him, is more developed at the cost of the underdevelopment of the Bharat. So, the farmers movement is the out, 
burst of the of the bharat against india we are we will be concentrating on this only that bharat against india and and what does sarad joshi mean by it uh, look sarad joshi means that notionally india has inherited from the british the mantle of or, or the or the or the i mean capability of economic social cultural and educational exploitation so india just the british uh, when the british left they has they have shifted the mantle of economic social cultural and educational exploitation to the india so this is a continuation of exploitation from the i mean british to the india quote unquote india and wh and what is bharat bharat is being exploited for the second time ever since the termination of the external colonial regime so we have got our independence but that independence was of india's independence not bharat's because after independence bharat is experiencing or bharat has been experiencing a second form of exploitation and and that exploiters is not no longer the britishers they have shifted the mantle to the indians now black britishers now have replaced the white ones so he is terminating or he is terming the 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 indians as black britishers so the black britishers now they have replaced the white ones so the white ones i mean the britishers colonialists they are no longer here but the exploitation over bharat is continuing and the black britishers i mean he is referring to the indians uh, that indians means that urban indians that industrial indians developed quote unquote indians so he is referring to these indians who are now exploiting the 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 bharats i mean the rural areas rural population underdeveloped segment of indian population so basically indigenous rural bharat has become the colony of the urban india that is the connotation which joshi is trying to put forward through the configuration or composition of bharat against india and so simply he is invoking the internal colonialism this is that it is not colonialism but internal colonialism within a country one segment is exploiting the other segment so the india or the urban or the industrial segment of india is exploiting the rural or the agricultural sector so that is india against bharat or bharat against india so joshi is locating the farmer's identity within this binary within this binary of bharat against india so it is clear that uh, the issue is not with class the issue is with identity identity of bharat and the farmer's identity has a very necessary connection with the overall situation social situation economic situation of bharat so according to joshi the basic contradiction i mean sarod joshi of shetkari sanghathan maharashtra the basic contradiction is not in the village so as i have already mentioned that the adversary is not within the village it is certain external agency so joshi is also of the same opinion that the basic contradiction is not in the village it is not between big peasants and small so that is not the case of i mean peasant movement farmers movement is not similar with peasant movements it is it is emphatically mentioned by joshi that the contradiction of farmers movement is not between big peasants and small peasants we have to keep it in mind that this contradiction between big peasants and small peasants uh, happens to be the basic contradiction of the peasant movement but the farmers movement have certain newer kind of contradictions have certain newer i mean features so the contradiction or or the basic contradiction as joshi says is not between big peasants and small not between landowners and landless as much like the peasant movements where the basic contradiction was between the landowners and landless in farmers movement the contradiction is not between landowners and landless but between the agrarian population as a whole and the rest of the society so the contradiction is between the agrarian population as a whole that is bharat against india agriculture versus say industry rural versus urban so the contradiction is uh, basically between the agrarian population as a whole and the rest of the society and similarly tikayat in punjab 
is also of the same opinion that the Kishan identity, it subsumes a full range of identities of caste, clan, community and class. So, so all the caste, all the clans, all communities, all religions, they are subsumed under the umbrella category of Kishan in Tikayat's view. So identity or the issue of identity is more important than the issue of class in farmers movement. Now, if we turn on to a colonialist standpoint, so what we can uh, learn from it, that construction of farmer identity is informed by the development discourse. Development discourse informs uh, construction of farmer identity. Now, uh, what is the implication of this? So, uh, as I have mentioned the similarities of the of the farmers movement with the new social movements now there are certain important differences of farmers movement with the new social movement look a, a, some segment of the scholars or critics they argue that farmers movement uh, much like the peasant mobilization is is a kind of rich peasant movement so the issue of class is always there because the issue of Kulak or rich peasant mobilization is there. So it's a rich peasant mobilization. Uh, so the issue of class is here. In a different form, although not in a typical similar manner with the, with the peasant movement, in farmers movement, land has always been an agenda of the movement. Now, so the agitational methods, as we have mentioned about the dharnas, government or boycott of mandis, they are not certain unique novel methods that the farmers movement have employed. In fact, some peasant movements or some, I mean, I mean, uh, women's movement or women in the anti-feminine agitations in Maharashtra and others, they have already employed this sort of techniques. So these are again not new. So ideology of the farmers movement they often exhibit agrarian populism. They are the basic character of, I mean, agrarian populism is the basic character of peasant movements. So nothing new about it. So the ideology, the, the, the agitational methods or the, or the demands or the contradiction, conflict code, they are nothing new about it. Critics are arguing in this fashion. So often we are talking about non-political, non-institutional space occupied by the farmers movement. That is also being challenged because uh, often farmers movement organizations have extended their supports to many political parties without any consideration of their ideological standpoints. So as they have extended support to the political parties and even Sharad Joshi formed a party like uh, the name was Satantra Bharat party in 1994 which even contested elections. So the claim of non-politics, the claim of non-political mobilization is also not uh, very, I mean not finds very well, I mean deep support then farmer's identity is a contradictory identity, uh, identity because although Tikat or Joshi is talking about that the farmer's identity is transcending the boundaries of class, caste, religion, gender, but often the identity of farmers have failed to cross the limit of gender, class and, uh, and religion. So it is a kind of contradictory unity that is the, I mean, uh, uh, farmer identity is not a kind of very flat, uh, homogeneous identity, uh, identity. It is always contested. There have been gender differences, there have been caste differences, there have been caste differences within the farmer. So the farmer's movement, if we uh, take a very overall view of the movement, uh, whether it is new or not, there are certain points favoring is the claim of new social movement, there are points against it. But the thing is that the farmers movement exposes a newer kind of configuration which is emerging in the Indian agrarian sector and the source of this change in the Indian agrarian sector is basically twofold. First, the introduction of the green revolution uh, technologies in the 1960s and then adoption of the I mean economic reform strategies in India that is characterized by liberalization, privatization and globalization and during the 1990s. So these two have brought Indian agriculture into a point of crisis, removal of subsidies or withdrawal of say uh, government from core areas of uh, say public uh, I mean services. So that are the newer contradictions, newer I mean configurations, newer 
form of contradictions that have been emerging in the agrarian sector and farmers movement simply reflect this. So, whether it is new or not that it is a sort of newer contradictions that have been reflected by farmers movement that is certain. Thank you.